and so I want something with some lower sides, but the Orlocks have to be high. And uh, I thought, you know, I think I can do this in a really um, aesthetic way and, and curve these sides. And uh, instead of having like a straight raised Orlock, because at the time people had low sided boats with the raised Orlock, but it was just kind of a blocky affair. And uh, so I built that first boat with, for John and called it the Recurve. Um, and and it, from there, it was, it's been almost the only hull that I make anymore. That was Jason Kajun sharing the recurve story, a feature that has helped him stand out from the crowd. This and how he flipped over a drift boat in whitewater, today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you can, let's take a quick stop right now and just uh, share this great episode. I know you're going to love it, and I'd love to uh, get the word out to somebody who uh, isn't aware of the Drift Boat series we have going. Um, This one is loaded with some uh, good content, including how you can... um, how you can build your own boat, build something that looks like what Jason has going here. So uh, let's stop and share this one out, and then we'll get back to the intro. Jason Kajun is here today to provide the story of how he started um, building boats and getting into boats as a kid up at Glacier National Park. We find out who his big influences were along the way, why his boat looks so much like an ocean-going vessel, and the story of building a specific boat so he could run the Grand Canyon. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. TurtleBox is a new company I've been working with this year. They build an amazing portable speaker that is louder and more rugged than anything I've ever encountered. Unlike most other portable speakers out there, the TurtleBox was specifically built with a sportsman in mind. The quality of this speaker is truly unreal. I've talked with the guys at TurtleBox, solid dudes by the way. They love the outdoors and are all avid sportsmen. This is a product I can truly say does not disappoint. Go ahead and check the guys out at turtleboxaudio.com. So without further ado, here is Jason Kajun from kajunboats.com. How's it going, Jason? It's going great, Dave. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for coming on here. I've been wanting to get you on for a while now as we've been doing this drift boat season. And, uh, you know, your boats, when I first saw them, I didn't know much about the stitch and glue. So I, we're going to dig into what that's all about and why your boats look so, you know, amazing out there. They, they look different than a lot of other things you see. Um, but before we get into all that, can you just take us back to, you know, I'm not sure where you got started with boats, but how did you get into it? And then how did you come to own a company now? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of... Uh... It's kind of a strange story in a, in a way because uh, growing up in Montana, obviously uh, not the biggest boat building community, but uh, strangely, I grew up in in the boat community. Uh, my folks ran uh, a boat called the Cinepa, which was a 45 foot uh, wood Carvel planked, um, you know, fully wood boat built in 1927. Uh, on a lake called Two Medicine Lake inside Glacier National Park. And so from the time I was a very small kid, I was uh, up uh, working on boats in Glacier Park, um, you know, alongside my my folks. And they did that for about 35 years. And as part of uh, what's called the Glacier Park Boat Company. And the boat company uh, dates back to the 30s and operates all of the uh, excursion boats or tour boats in Glacier Park. So all of the big lakes have boats on them. And uh, four of them date back to the 20s and were commissioned by the Great Northern Railway. And so, you know, it's a a little bit of a strange upbringing, you know, um, in the summertime for, you know, anywhere from three to five months, I was up in Glacier Park and uh was uh you know kind of the boat boy and and the the dock kid uh we had a fleet of rental boats and uh and then eventually i learned a fair amount about uh 
working on these these old uh, Carvel planked boats. Carvel just means uh, plank on frame. You have uh, ribs and then big planks. And, you know, by the time I got into my late teens, I was driving the boats and became a boat captain up there um, on these uh, inland lakes. Uh, and so that was kind of an interesting an interesting uh, way to grow up. And uh, uh, before I knew it, you know, it's kind of one of the only things I knew how to do. Right, right, right. This is this is awesome. I love, uh, you know, this start here because, you know, I've been digging into the history of the boats and we had an episode with Roger um, um, back. Let's see, I can't remember what episode it was, but it was near the start where he talked about the history of drift boats. But you're talking about now these Carvel boats. Can you describe, is this more of a... Um, like this is not a drift boat, right? This is more like a, a sailing type boat, or what is it exactly? Well, it's a motor boat, um, and the the smallest one up there is forty five feet. The largest one is ninety feet, which is up on Waterton uh, Lake and goes across the the border. And there's uh, there's two sister ships, the Cinepot and um, the Little Chief, and and then a, a boat kind of in between uh, the Dismet, which is 65 feet. They'll carry, the smallest ones carry 49 passengers, the largest ones carry 90. And uh, they're, they're just very unique, uh, very narrow beam boats, like I said, 45 feet to, to 90 feet in length, um, usually powered by like a 50 to 150 horsepower uh, motor. And they're very old. And they're taken out of the water every every year. You know, we pull them out and pull them into the boathouse, get a lot of work done on them in the fall and in the spring, and then dunk them in and carry thousands of passengers a year um, up and down these lakes and drop them off into the backcountry glacier. Okay. And and where would you, if you just wanted to look at these boats, where, where, where would you, is there a place you can go just to take a look at what they look like? Sure, yeah. Glacier Park Boat Company has a website. Yeah. Um, and then um, Glacier National Park um, features the boats, uh, you know, in some of their literature because they're the boats are at this point uh, on the historic registry um, since they're so old. And, you know, the Cinepa, the boat that I grew up on, is is nearing 100 years old here wow. in a few years. Um, so, yeah, really unique. It's getting a complete uh, overhaul right now up in the Flathead Valley. So, yeah, it was a real interesting kind of childhood uh, for sure during the summers when, when we were up there. You know, I didn't play Little League baseball. I was inside a national park and, uh, you know, we had a fleet of little wooden rowboats um, that would go out on the lake and um, canoes and later some some kayaks and things like that, motor boats. And uh, so kind of a, a real not quite a marina setting, but, uh, you know, kind of a, a unique, uh, uh, boating, um, experience there. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is, this is awesome. So basically, you know, I mean, you grew up around it, boat building and, and, and that, that makes sense where we're at now. How did you take it to, so you have all that and then eventually you've got these drift boats. What, what was that like? When did you get into the drift boat building? Well, the uh, middle fork of the flathead, uh, is the southern boundary of Glacier Park, and so even today, there's a lot of boats uh, on that on that uh, stretch of river, and uh, I think there's two or three raft companies. And there were a few uh, wooden dories on that river that I was familiar with, just a few uh, kind of old timers out of West Glacier, and so that was the first time I was in a drift boat was on the Middle Fork of the Flathead. And so I knew what this dory was. It was different in a way from the boats that I grew up with because obviously the lake boats are different with keels and, you know, um, you, you still row them. Um, but it was my first experience with that. By the time when I got out of uh, high school, um, I went to college for engineering initially, architecture, did a few years doing that, um, didn't do very well and pretty much just messed around Um uh, not uh, academically doing well. And then I ended up going out to the coast and getting a job. Uh, first, I was doing some logging out there, just trying to make money, and then ended up getting a job with, uh, with a boat builder um, south of uh, Olympia, Washington. And that's where I was introduced to uh, fiberglass and epoxy resin. And he was doing a sort of hybrid uh, we call it wood composite type of boat building 
you can call it stitch and glue, but it's a little stitch and glue is a little simplified for what it is. Um, instead of having a Carvel planked boat where you have uh, big, uh, you know, say 15 to 20 foot long planks or longer, and you screw these into frames, the the sides of the boat are made out of plywood and then sheathed in fiberglass usually. And so I worked for for that boat builder for um, not for very long actually. Um, uh, under a year, but it was long enough to go like, wow, okay, this epoxy and fiberglass, just a little bit of it in conjunction with, um, you know, really high quality plywood gets you um, some really uh, unique advantages uh, compared to um, a standard uh, framed um, river dory. And when I came back to Montana, that was my idea was to start making these boats um, specifically for fly fishing in a way that um that was just different from the the framed um river dories that you find in you know the mckenzie river and rogue river boats and so that was my idea was just like okay let's start making this type of of uh of dory uh plywood you know what we call uh you know plywood and composite and uh it just kind of took off huh Cool. And, uh, and who was that? The South, uh, Olympia, Washington, who was that boat builder? Did was that a big company or a small company? Yeah. A great guy named Sam Devlin. And, uh, he's, um, still going today, uh, does, he's a, he's a designer and does just some amazing, uh, boat designs. Um, you know, has a catalog of plans for, for boats from small pulling boats to, um, you know, almost, a, a trawler style, uh, live aboard boats, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, very salty, you know, oh, okay. um, uh, v- really, really nice boats. Gotcha. And, uh, and so, yeah, it taught, taught me a lot, um, in, in multiple ways about, about this type of construction. Gotcha. So not necessarily a drift boat builder, but just a boat builder of different, types. right. Just a boat builder. Yeah. 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 My whole, you know, kind of upbringing and experience is just in, in just boat building in gotcha. general. Um, previous to, uh, previous to river dories. Gotcha. Okay. And I, and I had some questions, you know, we're going to dig into some of the advantages of what you do versus some of the other types of boats, but I wanted to talk about, you know, the, <clears throat> the boat itself and kind of where you, again, you're, you're getting into this boat building. Where does that design come from? You know what I mean? You've got this drift boat. How do you get, um, you know, the thing you have actually, your boats look different than a lot of the other boats, but did you have somebody that you kind of learned the actual drift boat background, you know, design and specs on? No, I really didn't. Um, you know, when I came back from, uh, from Washington state, uh, moved back, went back to work for the Glacier Park boat company. I was in the Flathead Valley and there really weren't a lot of drift boats in the Flathead Valley at that time. Um, and you know, I, I became a fishing guide and you, and once you do that, obviously you, you see all of the, all of the different, uh, drift boats out there. And at that time there was Clackacraft, Lavro, um, and Hyde were pretty much the, the main three drift boat builders, all fiberglass. Um, and of course the Willie boats, the aluminum boats, but Ray Heater was still, um, was still b- building his kits and uh, there was a couple other uh, wooden boat kit companies. So I was aware of the McKenzie River style of boat. And every once in a while, you'd see one in the Flathead Valley. And there, you know, most of them are made uh, with the, you know, the 48 inch bottom from a standard piece of plywood. And so that's what I did at, at, at first as well. Just took a 48 inch bottom and, um, you know, basically just made a model like a cardboard model and tried to do my version of a McKinsey river style with a um, constant rocker. And, uh, so that was my first boat. It was, you know, probably, uh, a, a fif- 14 and a half to 15 foot long, um, uh, drift boat with a, you know, real, real narrow beam, 48 inch bottom and, uh, very simple, just kind of uh, bench seats, you know, just three yeah. bench seats completely open on the inside. And, uh, so that was my first one. And I, you know, I was just like, well, this is <laughs> here's here I go. I'm just going to try it. Yeah, and uh, that's what came out. And then later on, just built on that, made them wider, and then it just kind of morphed uh, from there over almost 25 years now into what it oh, is. Wow, wow. So yeah, 25 years, and that 
You know, and now I'm not sure if we could find that. I'd love to see the original picture. I've, I've just pictured it. In fact, I have um, Ray Heater. He's coming on here probably in a, in a, a month or so to, to talk about his story as well. But I mean, now when you look at your boats, these things look like, I mean, they look like a work of art. They look, what they look like is not just a drift boat. It, it looks like a mix between a drift boat and something you'd see on the ocean. You know what I mean? Because you've got these you got these compartments, at least the boats that I've seen, are compartments on the side, which are kind of like the Colorado compartments, you know, that same sort of thing. But you still have the open area for fishing, right? So it seems like, is that was that your thought? Was kind of bridging the gap between making this thing look like this beautiful wooden, like almost like a sailboat mixed with the, or you know what I mean? Yeah. How, how'd that come? Could yeah. Well, you know, with with my involvement with the, the boats in Glacier, um, all of the guys, all of the boat builders and the pilots up there in Glacier Park, in a way, were all historians as well. You sort of have to be a historian to work on wooden boats. And, um, you know, Montana has this this huge history of boats, basically from from the time the, the steamboats came up the Missouri. And so there's this there's this real connection for me with my boats to, you know, the older wooden boats. Um, and the history of that. And I just love that history. And, you know, probably if you talk to any wooden boat guy for very long, um, uh, you know, a non, (laughs) a non, uh, uh, dory guy, uh, coastal boats are, they go back to several designers, mostly on the East coast. And one of them was, uh, as, uh, Harishoff was Nathaniel Harishoff and, um, and L Francis Harishoff. And so that was a father son, team and well not really a team actually they Mm -hmm. came uh, one before the other but their designs were just so sleek and beautiful um, almost all sailboats and you know this yacht quality um, where a lot of smooth round uh, edges and you know in in general just a little bit different than you know kind of boxy is the wrong word but just sort of straight angled sides straight angled um, Mm -hmm. benches and compartments of a McKenzie River or a Rogue River boat, and I thought I can do that with this kind of process where you don't have frames. Um, I can incorporate all these things. So I sort of tried to have this almost kind of uh, um, an old 1800 sailboat ethic, uh, as far as design ethic um, and aesthetic, uh, to go into my boats, and that's where the rounded uh, stem, you know, the curved mm-hmm. stem came from. Um, which creates a little bit of reverse curve at the bow, and that's very that's a very Harishoff type of detail. So, you know, kind of paying tribute to some of these designers that were, you know, pre 1800s and way predated any any other river dory. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, and I guess when you look back in the history, and again, Roger mentioned some of this, where you know, drift boats. He noted how they actually did start in you know, kind of in Oregon in the the Rogue or the Mackenzie, but you know, the guys that came over, you know, they brought they came over from the east and you know obviously brought their design so it's cool you've kind of brought this old school thing and it doesn't seem like there's anybody else out there doing anything close are there other boat builders either doing stitch and glue or something similar to what you have going not to my knowledge you know there's um there's uh, a lot of guys that are building them from plans and there are some guys which will now in the internet age they can look online and look at a bunch of photos and then just start going. So there are a few guys that are out there doing it kind of in their garage and, and selling a few. Mm-hmm. Um, but to my knowledge, there's not, not the like a companies. dedicated boat shop, um, that, that isn't, uh, a plank or a, a frame style of, of drift boat. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let, let's dig into some of the, um, you know, it's interesting cause we, we've talked now I've had a few fiberglass boat companies and some aluminum. We've talked a little bit about this, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages of all of them. Um, but looking at your your design and, and the stitch and glue, maybe start us off with the stitch and glue. And you talked a little bit about it. But but what is, first of all, what is stitch and glue? And how is that different from just your normal, like, Ray's River Dory wooden boat? Sure. Well, you know, traditionally all wooden boats are, are fastened together. They have mechanical fasteners, um, you know, screws. And so traditional um, River Dory is no different. You have the frames on the inside and you screw the panels on and the bottom panel onto these frames and uh that it's a great method it it, they if they're done right they can last forever um but uh you do have you know several hundred 
um, ways for water to enter into the hull and into the frames. And so if you if they're not done correctly, if they're not uh, using the right materials, um, for instance, a lot of the the kit boats that you see, and, and one of the reasons that that drift boats have kind of or wooden drift boats have kind of a bad reputation is because um, a lot of them have been made with you know say pine frames and really cheap uh, fir plywood, and even sometimes just uh, iron fasteners um, or not bron- uh, bronze fasteners. Yeah. Um, and so they can, you know, they they get water going in there and they can rot. With uh, with the fiberglass technology, you essentially can remove the frames from the inside of the boat. You can still have a plywood hull. Um, you can have the plywood bottom panel and the plywood sides, but they're joined together uh, by fi- you know uh, strips of fiberglass uh, at the chine inside and outside, and a, and what's called a fillet. Uh, which essentially replaces the chine log um, on a frame drift boat. And that's um, uh, uh, essentially um, kind of a, a joint made of epoxy filled with a very fine uh, sawdust we call wood flour, and then um, fiberglass laid over that. And that that creates this very smooth joint on the inside chine. And when you do that, you get rid of all the fasteners. Hmm. And um, so once you get rid of the fasteners, you get rid of the, the water entering into the hull, and essentially you have a monocoque hull. It, it's, much, it's much stiffer. Um, it's, it can be lighter uh, that because you get rid of the frames. You do add some weight with the fiberglass. So there are some advantages from that standpoint. Um, but you still have the strength to weight ratio of wood, which is very high and, and quite good. Um, you know, the side panel of a of a, a wooden drift boat with, uh, you know, a good quality plywood is, is very lightweight if you were to compare it to really any other material, aluminum or fiberglass. Um, so those are some of the advantages of that, that kind of stitching glue process. And the stitching refers to, um, taking wire and literally putting a stitch between the side panel and the bottom panel at the chine and that temporarily holds this the the panels together and then you go in there and, and fasten them with the um, the fiberglass and, and epoxy and uh, so yeah that's that's in a nutshell is a difference between a um, you know a stitching glue um, or a um, and a framed drift boat gotcha okay so so yeah, and the advantages are basically, like you said, some of them. The, this boat is pretty light, and it's it's lighter than your typical, say, a wooden like a raised river dory type boat. Um, well, again, it depends on depends on the materials you use, but typically it, it would be much lighter, and it and also depends on what you want to put in it. You know, yeah. at this point, you know, I'm putting all sorts of stuff That's in right. my boats, which do not um, uh, contribute to being a, l- a lightweight boat. Um, no. It goes the other way. But if you were to take just a standard one. Um, you know, of, of the same size and shape with three bench seats, yeah, the, it would be much lighter than almost any boat out there. Okay. Yeah, and I think of some of the things you, you're adding that make it look pretty spectacular are, yeah, you know, I mean, just the compartments. I mean, that's something you don't see on many drift boats. You got these side compartments, right, which I'm assuming are completely dry. Is that what? What do you typically in those things? Is is that uh, what? What do you store in there? Just kind of miscellaneous stuff, or is that kind of where all your gear goes? <laughs> Yeah, no, it could be for anything. Um, it's funny, guys that are from, you know, not the drift boat world, they look at them and they go, uh, they they think that's where you put your fish. Uh, yeah, you know? <laughs> that's right. They're like, oh, live wells. Oh, right. right. Live well, one on each side. I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, once once I built the first boat with the, kind of the bench seats, um, the first thing that you think of is like, oh, I, now I got to step over these bench seats. So I thought I wanted to be able to walk from one end to the other. And at that time, there really, there were no boats. There were no drift boats where you could do that, walk from one to the other. So that was my main idea. And in order to do that, I needed to add this longitudinal um, support member to the side of the boat. Um, And so I added two 10-foot longitudinals, one on either side, and those helped stiffen the boat. And then also act as a shelf where you can then build uh, um, what we call dry storage compartments to that longitudinal. And then the other added benefit is that it's a great place to store a fly rod. So all those things kind of work together. And that's how I started doing the the dry storage. And, you know, um, 
being able to walk from one end of the boat and literally step out on a dry ground is a pretty nice feature. And th- and that's how that whole design evolution went down for me. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, so again, just looking at it, you've got, I mean, there's a bunch of other little th- features like the seats are pretty unique. You've got, I mean, it, it's all wood. Um, for the most part, the boat is all wood except for the fiberglass you use when you stitch it together. Is that correct? There's, there's no other, like the, the whole outside of the boat isn't fiberglass, right? It's mostly wood. Well, actually, no. Um, about, uh, geez, 50, almost 20 years ago now, I started working with a honeycomb material called Plascore. There's a bunch of different cord panels, um, and some people were experimenting with a foam-filled panel, and this, uh, this company came out with a, a honeycomb material, and it's not exactly new. If you remember uh, the old Hexel skis, uh, would have instead of having a wooden core, they had a, a hex uh, core for for a pair of downhill skis. And this is the same type of material. It's basically a sheet that is three quarters of an inch thick uh, with uh, extruded polypropylene in a honeycomb shape. And if you were to take a section of it out, it looks exactly like a beehive. Um, about pencil sized uh, cores um, in this honeycomb shape. So it's air filled. So instead of having a bottom panel that's made out of you know, half inch to, in some cases, three quarter inch plywood, you have a bottom panel, which is three quarters of an inch thick and it's air filled and it's super lightweight. It has, um, extremely good compression strength, uh, because of all of the, the honeycomb structure. And then on the inside and the outside of that panel, uh, what I do now is I vacuum bag Kevlar, uh, and some, uh, kind of strategic carbon fiber, into um into that panel so it's a the bottom panel of the boats actually has no wood in it um and hasn't for like it's all going on 20 years now for my boats and so just the side panels are made out of okumi plywood uh, so you have a really light side panel a really light bottom panel that's also extremely strong um, with the kevlar and carbon fiber um, vacuum bagged inside and out so you have just a, a really super light, super strong, rigid hull with that method. Gotcha. Okay. So, so basically, and you say bottom versus the top. So the, like the bottom third is that, that Kevlar or that mix. And then the, the upper two thirds is wood. Is that kind of how it is on your side panels? No, no. The side panel is, uh, is all, um, is all wood. It's so it's a okay. Okay, mahogany side panel, just like, just like uh, a normal, um, you know, framed river dory is. Yep. But the bottom panel is what is that honeycomb material. Oh, the, and the bottom the bottom panel being the bottom of the boat. Exactly. Yep. Okay. The whole bottom panel of the boat, the whole football shaped, um, you know, bottom panel is that Plasco or honeycomb. Yep. And uh, it's yeah, it's a really great method. Makes it a super lightweight, very strong. Takes tremendous hits and abuse. Um, because this is, you know, one of the few boats where the job description is, okay, you have to hit rocks all day long. Yeah. You know, I mean, most most boats don't have that. There's very few boats where, you, where you, uh, the job description is to just pummel into rocks on a daily basis, even though you really try not to, yeah. obviously. Gotcha. Cool, cool. And uh, and so on the bottom, though, I'm just curious about this because I just had a, I'm not sure if you've heard of the company uh, Wetlander. They make like a bottom, uh, a slick coating thing. And um, yeah. yeah, 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 I've used it. You have, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah, good. So you've used that. Is it, um, so on the bottom of your boat, you have this, do you need something like that? Or is your boat good to go just with the honeycomb product? Well, anything adds to the bottom. So, it, you know, it just depends on how much you want to sacrifice for weight. Um, what I've done for years is have uh, Linex sprayed on. It's really the only thing oh, yeah. that we don't do ourselves at the shop and we we've used linex um i think we were one of the first people one of the first boats to do it um i'd never heard of anybody else doing it before um and we put linex on the bottom and they have the capability to spray that very smooth and you know there's a ton of different truck bed liners out there nowadays and they're all some sort of um you know kind of polyethylene or uh that you can spray on but uh, some are more rubbery than others. And, you know, years ago, like uh, Rhino linings were, yep. were kind of a more rubbery bottom. And Linux was much more of what kind of a hard plastic uh, um, lining. And so that's what we've used with really good results. 
um, for many years now. And then I have also uh, used that wetlander over the top of that. And that's another really good layer to have on there and just makes them extremely slippery. Um, I mean, they will just slide right off the trailer at the boat ramp with that wetlander. So, yeah, a lot of good products now. I mean, the technology just keeps getting better all the time. And, you know, I'm always on the lookout for something I can improve the the performance of the boat while still – you know, obviously keeping within the, the wooden boat aesthetic as much as I want, as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, this is good. I think <clears throat> this gives us a perspective on what you have going. And I, I think back a couple, you know, we had, um, a couple of skiff, you know, we had, uh, adipose boats and boulder boat works, um, on, they talked about, you know, the skiff was a big thing they have going. And it's interesting because you mentioned you had this open thing back when you did this 20 years ago and you opened up the walk around. So were there any of those skiffs around or was, was that not there yet? Okay, that that's river, um, they're calling it a river skiff, right? You've seen that with the the flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only skiff around was the the South Fork skiff, and the South Fork skiff um, was a really popular boat uh, for a while amongst guides in in Idaho and and um, down around Jackson Hole. And then I don't know why they quit making them, but then that that mold came up north, and I believe that that was the the basis for Adipose. Um, when they started making their skiff and, uh, I started making skiffs also, uh, probably about 15 years ago, we started making one, um, which we call the Freestone skiff. And it was the first boat that had the, the straight line rod storage on the side and the three pedestals in the middle. And it was a punt. So it had a flat transom on the front and then my, um, little rounded transom that I do aft. And so made quite a few of those boats. And in fact, that's one of the boats that I guided out of. And I would to this day prefer to fish out of is, is that skiff. I, and I still have one. And, uh, so, and then I made another skiff, um, about 10 years ago, I have another model of skiff that I started, which has the kind of recurve sides so that the oar locks are a little bit higher and, uh, almost a double ender, uh, yeah. with two of the rounded transoms and, and, uh, only made a few of those, but, uh, probably one of my favorite boats. So yeah, big fan of the skiff and, um, uh, compared to a stand up, you know, river dory, um, that's what I prefer to fish out of whenever I go fishing and, you know, there's a couple of buddies and, you know, it's usually guides or former guides and everybody knows how to fish really well. You know, it's like, okay, who's got the skiff? <laughs> that's, that's what we're using. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Um, have you designed, I'm just curious, cause we mentioned that Colorado stuff and we had a, a guest, uh, a couple of guests on that talked about that. Have you designed anything for, uh, you know, like the, the decked over fully decked over boats for that, uh, that river? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Um, I've got a design. I haven't made it public. Um, and it's just a, a design that I built for myself. Um, in fact, it's kind of our family boat. Um, it's an 18 foot, uh, whitewater dory. And, uh, yeah, great boat. I really love them. Um, took it down the Grand Canyon and took it down the middle fork of the salmon and also oh, cool. took it down the Selway River as well, which is always not often used, not often, uh, gone down in a hard boat, but, um, I took one down oh, there wow. as well. Wow. And, uh, so yeah, I love, love that boat. Was that a, uh, and I'm looking at one that's the, uh, the two medicine. It's like a painted. Is yeah, it? that's it. That's all oh, that. So that's it. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering. So. So that's it. So yep. it look it looks like when you first see it, you're like, okay, that does because it's got the name. You're like, that does look like a Grand Canyon boat. Although it looks, um, so it has the full rocker. So it's more still the McKenzie style. No, no, it's got a big flat uh, oh, does. section in the in the bottom. Yeah, yeah it's 18 feet, um, and it has a quite a long flat section. Yeah, it's a little bit wider than a Briggs Dory, just a, a little bit. You know, some of those Briggs stories are only uh, 50 inches. There's a few out there. Um, most of them now are, are wider and 16 to 18 feet. And, and this boat's just right about that size. It's it's um, just a little bit wider than a Briggs and about 18 foot four. So it's actually slightly larger than most of them. Doesn't have quite as high a bow. Um, it's about three inches uh, shorter at the stem. Um, and of course the whole inside is a different design than the Briggs, um, dory. And, you know, I just, it was just my take on, on a whitewater dory. I wanted it to be a little more, um, you know, just a, a little more of a consistent shear line. Um, uh, not quite as, as sitting up as high in the water. I guess that comes from my, you know, um, 
you know, kind of fishing background where you, you don't want to have these boats that are like up in the wind a lot. One of the strange things about it is that it really does, um, slice through the waves quite nicely because of that, um, that reverse curve in the bow and, um, it, you know, really performs well in white water. So I've been pretty happy with it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I was curious. I'm always, for some reason I have this grand Canyon since I haven't been down there. I'm curious on, you know, taking the drift boat. I mean, what, what was it like when you went down? Was it pretty, um, you know, did you get in any trouble or anything like that? No, no. Had a real clean, real clean run. It was, the water was, um, medium high, you know, from, uh, you know, the, how it is uh, over the year. I can't remember the exact, uh, CFS, but, yeah. um, uh, didn't, didn't flip anything, didn't hit anything. Um, you know, definitely drove that boat right down through a lot of big waves and just filled it up to the gunnels, um, with water, but it's self bailing, um, in the cockpits, except for the footwell, um, my footwell where I row, um, and I have a, a manual bilge pump in there and also a little solar powered, uh, 12 volt bilge pump, um, just to get that, that water out of the footwell. Uh-huh. And, uh, because my footwell goes all the way to the bottom, um, you know, and like a lot of those brigs are up really high, but I really like to stand sometimes. Yeah. Um, I like to stand and push and I like to stand and look, um, look ahead and without, you know, kind of sitting up, standing on my feet, still keeping track of the oars. So, um, you know, just did a few things different in the brigs. I mean, I'm a big fan of the brigs and, um, you know, the, the lineage of them coming out of Oregon and, mm-hmm. um, Martin Litton and all of that history. So I'm a huge fan of those, uh, Grand Canyon river dories, but, uh, yeah, just my take on a, yeah. on a whitewater dory. You're, you're taking, you didn't, and if your boat, if that boat was the flip, same deal, you could just kind of roll it back over and is that the, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and I did flip it, um, on the Selway. Oh, no kidding. Um, but, uh, I didn't flip it on the Grand. Yeah. What was that experience like flipping it on the Selway? Oh man. Uh, well just, uh, you know, just a mistake on my part, you know, it didn't have anything to do with it being a a dory instead of a raft. I just, um, took a line that was probably not the right line and missed an oar stroke and, um, came up on this big pillow and, and she just flipped over so quick and washed around into this little rock garden. And, um, I was, uh, uh, able to flip it back over. I, I had to, um, you know, kind of take some stuff out of it and, uh, luckily I washed into this area where, where I had, uh, a pretty easy current and I was able to, uh, to flip it back over and put, put huh. coolers back in and continue on downstream. Um, did a little bit of damage to, um, the transom on it because I, I have that rounded transom with the handle and that hit the bottom of the river when it flipped. And so I had to do a little repair on the, on the river, but, uh, overall fairly unscathed and, uh, uh, lesson learned on that, on the line, on that rapid. I can't remember exactly what rapid it was, but. Wow. Wow. So, so you flip it over. So you're, so you, I mean, I've been upside down a, uh, at least one good time. Um, but you know, I mean, once you flipped it, you know, did you pop right up and then you're next to the boat and then how'd you flip the boat back over? Yeah, I just popped right up. I was right next to the boat. One of the oars was in the water, um, tethered and I grabbed the oar and uh was able to kind of swing the boat and direct it into a little pocket and uh once it came into that pocket i just kept moving it until i could get it into a into a section of river where i could almost use the current to my advantage to flip it back over oh, yeah. and uh um uh yeah and just fl- you know eventually got it flipped over by myself i uh, you know my partners uh, in the in the crew they were all on the side of the river like signaling to me because they were going to swim out. And I was like, well, just, you know, I, I kept holding up my hand, like, hang on, hang on. Let yeah. me see if I can do this before you, you know, s- go for a swim to right. come out and help me. Um, and, and luckily, it, you know, it was in a good place. I mean, obviously you can always get into some pretty bad situations with that. Yeah. Um, you know, you flip a boat, whether it's, you know, on the ground and you go for a big swim or, or in a real rocky river, like the Selway, um, you know, and, and there's no doubt I got lucky about the area where it was, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, <laughs> big that, adventure on that one. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It seems extreme. It always seems like obviously the decked over boats, you they're, they're floating. So that's good. But just the fact of a hard, but a hard boat, especially a wooden boat floating down and banging through rocks, you know what I mean? So it sounds pretty extreme. Yeah. That's cool. You, well, you know. it is, but you know, we flipped a, a few rafts, um, 
on that trip and I've seen a number of rafts slip, you know, on the ground and man, you don't want to have one of those suckers upside down in the river either. Boy, they're just banging on yeah. the rocks and all the banging up hanging the frames out. and all your gear and yeah. flipping one of those things is a real ordeal. You know, trying to flip an 18 footer loaded on the ground, uh, that is no fun. That takes your oh, entire right. party. So in many ways, a dory is, um, is dory much is easier, easier to, to yeah. deal with. Yeah, I've watched some of the video. There's one really, Oars has a really good video on this um, boat. That I can't remember if it was in lava, one of the rapids. It flips, and it shows the whole thing. It shows them going. It took them three minutes by the, since they flipped the boat, and then the, the guy they had straps on the side, they were able to flip it back over. You know, I think it took three yep. of them. You know what I mean? But like in three yep. minutes from flipping to getting it back up and high-fiving, you know what I mean? It's like that quick. It's just, it's pretty amazing, right? Yeah, if you have your, if you have together you can do it pretty quickly yeah <laughs> so yeah i think that jeff aronson is it does a lot of videos of grand canyon guide i don't know him personally but um you know one of the old uh, salty guides there on the canyon and i think that he's yeah he's one of the guys that puts up these videos and you know just amazing footage of these things going through there yeah yeah gotcha okay cool and and what was on that grand canyon was there one rapid that was really the toughest one or were they all kind of similar well, lava, you know, yeah. lava is always the uh, the the one that gets your butterflies up. I mean, I the all of the other uh, rapids I felt were fairly straightforward. Crystals, the other big one, and um, and a lot of people think crystals, you know, a little scarier than lava because it has that big rock island in the middle and uh -huh. some really nasty holes in it. Yeah. And uh, but I was able to skate around the big holes and, um, and, you know, it's just so much more maneuverable than a, than a raft. And, um, so yeah, I really didn't have any issues with it. And lava was a real clean run all the way through and just super fun. I actually I did run a video on that one on the boat. So it's, it's cool to watch. I love, I love, uh, replaying those and just seeing like, oh man, that was, <laughs> that was nice. some big water. Nice. Did you, is that video out there on uh, the YouTube or Instagram or anything? Yeah, it's I th it's on my YouTube. Oh, on, good. Um, yeah, uh, on my uh, YouTube channel. I think it's Montana Boat or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah. don't really I don't really have a big YouTube presence. I'm not I'm not hip to all of that stuff quite yet. I want to sure. be. Uh, sure, but, sure. But as long as yeah, <laughs> you know, if you got that video, I mean that's that's well worth. I'll take a look at that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty fun. Huh. Okay, well, I think, um, you know, it feels like I have a good feel for what you have going. I mean, it, it, anything else you want to touch on here as far as the boat? I mean, we talked about the boat building. I know I heard something about the, out there. Somebody was talking about how, you know, to do what you do or the stitch and glue, you kind of need to have almost like a CAD design sort of thing. Is it is the thing with your boat, do you, do you need to be super engineering background to, to make one of these things? Or, or what's your take on that? Oh, no, no, for sure. You can... You can do one with, you know, I built my first boat. I had, I didn't even have a skill saw. I had a jigsaw and I had two clamps and I built it in my garage. And, uh, you know, I told my wife, I was like, Hey, I think I can make money on these drift boats. And, and that's the only thing I had. And so we just went for it in the garage. And since then, you know, started selling plans and hundreds of, of guys have, have built these things all over the country. And actually I send plans oh, cool. all over the world. And, um, and so I, uh, I have guys that have built them in, you know, Argentina converting the plans and we're talking back and forth and they're about, they're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, with very limited access to tools. So you definitely don't need an engineering background. You know, I do some CAD work, um, on my boats. I do have a CNC machine and, um, for repeatable parts, um, I do some CAD, uh, to be able to machine parts and, and make them be repeatable and very, you know, very uniform and consistent, um, but that's not necessary for the, for the home builder. That's not, it's not, doesn't have to be part of it, but they just keep getting more and more specialized for me. And, you know, I keep getting requests for different things. And now I'm putting little 12 volt systems in them. People want USB ports and, um, <laughs> you know, in, little interior, you know, kind of fairy lights. Sure. I have, I had some customers that they, they fish so much steelhead, um, and they're out till dark and come and sometimes going out in the dark. And so they wanted to be able to, to, you know, light the inside of the boat. We put three propane heaters in there. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, just all sorts of crazy stuff. I'm trying to, to do as much of the, the building as I can in house to the point that we're casting, um, hinges now, you know, we're casting our bronze hinges. I'm really just not happy with, 
plastic hinges and things that you buy online. So as much as possible, that's, that's the way, that's the way I'm doing it. And, uh, it's, uh, yeah, they're getting to be pretty specialized. So, and yeah, that's the only, you know, kind of issue. I get a lot of plans builders and kits builders and they want to do the boats exactly as they see my boats on Instagram or on the website. Um, and I'm like, man, you can do anything you want, but just know that, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, even, even with two really loaded shops, I might take four or 500 hours on a particular build with a spray booth and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, but I still really, you know, encourage guys to like, hey, build your own boat. I mean, you can do it rather mm-hmm. than going out and buying, a, you know, an off the shelf boat, build it, man. That's cool. So, and if somebody wanted to to get into building a boat like yours, you could, like you said, you can they can buy plans just directly from you. Yep, yep. I sell plans, um, plans and kits off my off my website, and and have for quite a while. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, I have I have so many designs I I that I would love to get on on paper. It's just so hard to to convert everything to paper. And um, but I do have four designs that I offer as plans. Um, and um, they're for the most part like the ones that I build. It just depends on how much elbow grease you want to put into them, and um, so that yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and and on those plans. So this is interesting. And I just wanted before we get out of here, because I have had we've talked. You know, like I said, aluminum, fiberglass, wood. We've got all the thing. When you talk about the difference between say what you have going and say a uh, some of these fiberglass boats. I mean, what what is what is the advantage of, of this boat? Are there any advantages over the fiberglass? Other than I mean, it, obviously it looks well. I amazing. think so. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, you know, the 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 advantages of getting rid of the frames in the wooden boat and not having that uh, the issue of having uh, the wood rot is is one of the main ones. Um, the, second to that, they're so much lighter weight than any of the fiberglass boats. Oh, okay. And and I like to think that all the features that I have in them stand out as well. Of course, they've almost all been, um, I would say. How, how how should I put this? Um, honorably copied over right. the years. Um, a lot of the the boat companies. I mean, they're the curve sides and the and the recurve style sides and and my rope seats and yep. the even the rod holders and stuff. You know, you you start to see those in a bunch of other designs, and that's fine. You know, the the industry. You know, we all can borrow from. It's not like uh, I didn't borrow from. You know, the hair shops and right. The, uh, yep. But uh, there, I, with all of that modeled together, I think that it it creates a boat which has just a tremendous advantage over any other boat. I mean, I can float down through things that no other um, drift boat is going through. They're just so much lighter weight. They're very durable on the inside. They're du- very durable on the outside as well. Huh. Um, but uh, you know, one of the other things that I like to think about them is that, and I don't use this word lightly in this day and age, but is you know they're sustainable. Um, you know, the, the, the plastic boats, um, and the fiberglass boats, um, you know, they're at some point they end up in a landfill and and I just don't like that. Um, you know, these, there's not one of my boats that isn't still, isn't still going out there in the, in the universe. They're always repairable, easily repairable. Um, the maintenance is, is, uh, quite low on them compared to the old style of frame drift boat. So I think those are a lot of really good advantages to this, to this method. And, um, it's a, it's a big thing to me anyway, that, you know, using the best materials, these boats can really be lifetime boats. And, um, so that, yeah, that's, that's one thing that I really point to with them. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not really in competition with any other boat builder. I just, you know, I might only be doing one or two a year anymore. So, um, uh, that part doesn't really matter to me. Um, but I do like to just use the best materials as possible so that they, they just have all the advantages that, that, um, are available. Um, and, yeah. uh, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, and obviously that's one of the, maybe the disadvantages that I'm not sure on the cost, but I mean, obviously if you were to build this boat for somebody that probably costs a lot more than anything out there, um, I'm guessing right on the market. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, when I first started building, we were pushing boats out for like 5,000 bucks and you know, I, uh, I was not a businessman, you know, I mean, I started this when I was, uh, 25 years old. Um, and, 
you know, uh, 25 years later, here we are. And it took me probably 15 years before I was like, oh, man, I'm just barely breaking even. Yeah. <laughs> you know how it is. Um, you're learning how to do that kind of stuff. And um, and when we went over $10,000, the first time we sold a boat for $10,000, I was like, oh, well, that's it. No one's ever going to buy one of these. Right. <laughs> and and then it went over 20. Um, and now, I mean, some, I don't, it's, you know, a lot of the fiberglass and, and other boats are, gosh, they're in the high, nearly $20,000. Um, and then I just finally decided like, you know, I need to be able to make a living doing this. I need to charge, you know, a good wage hourly. Um, and, and that's, so my boats are, are very expensive because they have a lot of hours in them. And I spend, you know, obviously as much as I can on good materials, um, and I, and that's another difference that you find in the wooden boat world is you typically spend more money um, on materials uh, because you want the best quality. And inherently, uh, fiberglass, you know, it, it's so popular not because it's a better material, but because it's cheaper. And with the advent of fiberglass, you know, um, and gel coats and all of that. Uh, it's very cheap for a, a 50 gallon barrel of that stuff. And that's great because you can knock out a bunch of them. They're mu a much cheaper entry point and a lot yeah. of people can have them and get on the water. So that's a great advantage to them. But it's, um, it, yeah. to me, it's a disadvantage. I want to use higher quality materials where, where I can and have these boats last forever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So basically your boats are, like you said, over, you could easily pay over 30 K for, you know, one of these deck, deck one of these nice boats like you see out there. Yeah. 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 And it, it's so weird, Dave, you know, over the years I go, I can't, you know, I'm building these boats and I get comments all the time online about like 30 K or more. Right, even. Right, right. You've had boats over 40 with stuff. And and I and I just go, you know, some guys are, some guys just want the best. I mean, yeah. or, you know, they just want to be really comfortable in in what they're doing. They want a custom built. It's worth more than the money to them. It's sort of a, a lifetime uh, legacy uh, project. You know, they might pass it down to their kids. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of where that comes from. But yeah, sometimes I just go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that totally. this is what <laughs> this is what it is. You know, uh, making both making river dories for this amount of money yeah exactly yeah it's it's pretty crazy and i just you know as i'm looking at again i'm looking at another boat here on your instagram it's a green boat and i just this the way the sides are right it's this very narrow uh you know kind of the bow and then it goes and this it's low and then it's got these curves it almost looks like um or maybe it's the stealth craft almost have you seen those stealth crafts they got this really curvy um, I'm just curious. I'm not sure on the history of that boat. Is that something that is a similar, uh, similar design to what yeah, there's our aluminum, I think. Right. So it's different, but well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to, um, uh, definitely want, don't want to, uh, a bad mouth yeah. anybody other boats, but, um, for sure, you know, any of the boats out there that you see with those curved gunnels and sides, yeah. I mean, that, that came, I, I'm trying to not point fingers or anything, sure, but that sure. all came from my boats. Um, you know, we've, we even had a couple of, of legal encounters oh, wow. with other boat companies where, gotcha. you know, I, you know, I said, Hey, this is, you know, I have a whole copyright copyrights on my hulls and they were, um, and people had copied some of those and, and were selling them. And yeah. in the end, I just decided, all right, there's, I'm not going to be able to stop it. I just need to build a better mousetrap and keep innovating. <laughs> and that's what I try and do. But yeah. any of that stuff, you know, when you see these wooden rope seats and you see the curved gunnels, yep. um, you that's know, it. that, that stuff just didn't exist, um, in, you know, 15 years ago, uh, it was all very flat shears, very straight profiles. And, uh, jo uh you know, John Bailey, um, the son of Dan Bailey, he, uh, mm -hmm. John came out to me and, and you know, we wanted to build a boat and he said, I want to be able to get in and out of this thing a lot easier. And so I want something with some lower sides, but the oarlocks have to be high. And, uh, I thought, you know, I think I can do this in a really, um, aesthetic way and, and curve these sides. And, uh, instead of having like a straight raised oarlock, because at the time people had low-sided boats with the raised oarlock, but it was just kind of a blocky affair. Mm -hmm. And um, so I built that first boat with, for John and called it the Recurve. Mm. Um, and and it, from there, it was, it's been almost the only hull that I make anymore uh, because that has been really a successful boat. And uh, and uh, so that's how that that came about. 
That's it. That's it. Cool. Yeah. There's all sorts of, and there's all sorts of little design things you see out there. Like the, um, there's one, I think it's Pavati. They, they have aluminum. They've got like the door up on the front of the boat. Right. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I always thought that was yep. interesting because I've kind of obviously getting out of the boat isn't that hard. But I guess if you're older, you know, having a door, you know, would be nice. Um, that's not something you, you've ever. Oh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's a real kind of an, an interesting innovation those guys have done. And, you know, I just had my knee replaced. Oh, um, wow. So I can really understand how, how that would be a great feature. You know, it, it definitely gets harder as you get older to get in and out of these things. Um, and there's a lot of those kind of cool innovations. I, I've really wanted to build a, a handicap accessible, um, skiff for quite a while. And, um, I just wanted to be able to make it almost like a landing ramp where, oh, yeah. you know, um, folks can get in and out and, and even, even row the boat, you know, from a yeah. chair for, or from a limited mobility standpoint. So that's on my drawing board and, there you, go. you know, maybe someday I'll, I'll build one of those. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's there's the so much to do so many cool innovations that you can do with the with the dory platform and um nowadays man it, it just seems to be taking off there's more and more boat builders and guys are doing some incredible stuff out there it, yeah. it's really cool to see yeah yeah no i, I can tell you the um for sure, when we post this, when you know we get this up there, and we post, uh, you know, a picture of one of these boats maybe on our Instagram, it'll probably be the most viewed um, post. You know what I mean? Just because it's so. Not only is the drift boats get a lot of views, but just the um, the design. You know, your boat is so unique. I think that's when I first saw it. So, yeah, it's it's really cool to yeah. be uh, talking to you here. Um, I guess before we get out here, anything in the next uh, six months or so, you want to give a shout out? Anything new coming up for you or your your company? Well. Um... You know, from a design standpoint, I'm still working on, I'm always working on these plans and trying to get um, better plans out the door for, for these home builders and uh, do have a lot of requests for the whitewater dory plan. So hopefully I'll get those out. Um, I, one of the things that I'm most proud of and I'm trying to, um, to work on is um, uh, I built a boat and uh, painted it for this warrior movement um, for these kids up on the Salish and Kootenai oh, yeah. uh, reservation where my family's from. And um, we point, painted it with this warrior logo. And so I hope to deliver that this summer um, to the Flathead Reservation and, you know, get in with, uh, you know, this an outdoor program up there and get these kids out fishing and in uh, river dories on the Flathead River. Um, they've got just some amazing resources up there going through the reservation and around that area that is, you know, kind of the homeland for us. And uh, so I, that's one thing that I'm really um, hoping to to get delivered this summer and, and accomplish and um, kind of proud of that. It, you know, these it, it's uh, bringing the younger generations in is yeah. I think the the best way forward yeah. for all of the stuff that we love to do, you know, fishing and boating combined. Um, and then other than that, uh, you know, we, we do have a, uh, uh, a scenic uh, boat comp uh, a portion of the company called Freestone Deluxe River Trips. And we do scenic trips, you, you know, actually um, most of them are non-fishing um, just to really get on the water and enjoy and not be looking at the water, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet away from the boat the whole day and not looking up at the eagles and the moose and the, and the mountains. And you sit there with a, a beer in your hand and people are loving those trips. And we're going to be doing trips on the Missouri River on the wild and scenic portion. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, you know, just love yeah. all that stuff. Looking forward to more trips everywhere. It's it's kind of my my family's uh, the thing that we do, you know, and uh these river trips are just the best. It's one of the the pleasures of life. That's cool. And I'm looking at another photo I got. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is in your garage or your 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 office there, but you got you got your boat. I think it's the one you took down the Colorado, and you're looking out the garage at some mountains. Is that are you kind of at the base of uh, of some mountains? I guess you're in uh, now. Now, where are you at exactly? Which town? Yeah, that's yeah. Our, uh, my boat shop is uh, uh, south of Livingston in the Paradise Valley, kind of uh, halfway uh, towards Yellowstone National Park, um, where the Yellowstone River, of course, runs right through the Paradise Valley. And so I have two shops and, yeah, just a, a really nice setting. You open the front door, you're looking right yeah. out at the Absarca Beartooth there you go. Uh, Mountains and uh, right on the Yellowstone. It's just, uh, yeah, a great environment. We do a lot of... Uh, you know, you got to test every boat. So that's the yeah. fun part. You put them right <laughs> at the river out the door and, 
and uh, that's uh, a great, great thing about that's living right. here. That's right. All right, cool. All right, Jason. Well, uh, hey, uh, if anybody wants to find you, it's just uh, uh, kajunboats.com. Yeah, kajunboats.com. Email is the best way for me. Um, and uh, and then, yeah, on Instagram, we have kajunboats as well. And uh, I'm a little bit of a novice on all of that stuff, but just trying to keep a presence on there. Yeah. Uh, people really love seeing the photos. And so, um, uh, yeah, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Okay. Other than that, it's on the river, Dave. <laughs> yeah, de- definitely. Yeah, I hope to hope to run into you out there sometime down the line. I uh, it's been a lot of fun connecting with you and hearing the story. I you know obviously didn't know much about it, and, and hopefully um, you know some people have learned what you have going. And yeah, maybe we'll see a few more custom boats uh, based on your plans. Uh, you know, as we go. So uh, yeah, thanks again for all your time today. You bet, you bet. Well, we'll do it. We'll have to do a we'll have to do a trip together. All right, sounds good. I'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we covered, just go to webflyswing.com slash 196. If you can, uh, you can go to uh, our resources page at uh, wetflyswing.com slash resources. And this is the place where um, I put links to some of the books and a few videos, but mostly books that uh, our guests have talked about. So if you want to check that out and see what they recommend, Uh, Those are affiliate uh, links, so um, we get a commission here for the podcast at no additional charge to you if you purchase through those links. want to thank you in advance if you have a chance to purchase. So I don't have a summary for you today. Um, I don't have a top tips. This episode, I kind of, uh, I was just uh, consumed and didn't really... um, uh, didn't really have a chance doing that, but I hope you got some enjoyment out of it. I know, I know I definitely love looking at boats. Um, something I enjoy doing, just looking at a good boat. So when you see a nice drift boat that's got, especially like this one, such style and, uh, and kind of history and, and all that stuff, it was pretty awesome. I hope you enjoyed it today. Uh, I think that's all we have for you. I uh, want to thank you for stopping by the show today. I appreciate your support and hope to uh, maybe eventually catch you on the river or maybe uh, talk to you online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.